much sauce There's here. a lot to love today. And we are into champs like now as well. So EDG on the blue side here for this game. Energy Pacemaker over on the red. John of the first band for Andrew Gaming. And Lissandra there banned for EP. So nothing's changed yet on 5.21. Nothing's changed yet, but there's going to be some adaptations, I'm sure. Kassadin goes out. The Chinese Kassadin has been so, so scary. So understandable ban. Yeah, is he going to get banned there as well against Pawn, especially who's shown possibly the most proficiency on that champion, so a smart ban there as well. I just love his commitment style. He always goes for that Zonia second, gets in your face, uses that Emperor's Divide to divide up a team, as the name suggests, I guess. But uh, he's been so apt in using that as an initiation tool. I guess it's worth saying that his initiation champs have pretty much been Fizz and uh, the Azir, and both of them are nerfed now. Both of them probably won't be seeing play in the mid lane, at least, or he's banned out as the Azir in this series. Does he have another initiation pick? That's kind of what I'm looking to see. It's porn. I'm going to guess he does, but Probably. we'll see here as EDG ban at least in as their last ban. Going to kind of target Drizzle there with the jungle ban. Yeah, so there's still a lot of champions open. I mean, Nas nah, seen some nerfs in this patch. You know, we've been on 4.21 for a long time. It was a bit supercharged back there, but he's still a very competitive pick in the top. His laning has seen most of the nerfs right there. So, wow, the Kalista. No, Kalista's seen so much play so quickly in the LPR. They were... They didn't pick her up, and then as is always the way, right? They try to take nods from other scenes. Someone starts. I believe it was Imp who was the first one to pick up Callista, and then everyone was playing it. We've seen Callista games do very well. Of course, Snake forced a surrender from Vici very early once uh, the triple came in for Crystal on that Callista. We've seen other people struggle against strong tanks, but uh, not in this series at least. Yeah, and EDG are going to get Nah here for Koro. I've been saying it for weeks now. Don't give Koro Nah, but it is different now. He has been changed a little bit. So it be interesting to see if uh, EP now on the new patch are more comfortable letting that champion through. Koro and Kohler are from Star Hunt Royal Cup have been the standout Nah players. So giving it to Koro is always a risk right here. What the answer is, I hope it's not the Javan top. Of course, Javan, usually a jungler, is a bit of a flex pick in the top lane. But uh, the all-in flavor against a Nah. Lupus tried it so many times, it just doesn't work. Well, Amazing Day does love his Javan top, but it is going to be Javan Thresh here for EP. So we'll see what happens, but I imagine you're right, it's probably Drizzle's jungle there as well. EDG now can have about 20 seconds or so to take their few picks, and we've had, a, again, a lot of changes here. Very curious to see what these teams want to go on. That hover tells us quite a bit. So that's Hecarim. That is Hecarim. And uh, Hecarim sends some buffs, and Clear Love is a famous Hecarim player, so it's wonderful to see that champion in here. I'm so excited already. The Hecarim coming out. It's not usually Clear Love that mixes up the jungle pool. He picked up Nunu, and you're like, all right, he's not a big ganker. That kind of makes sense, but uh, Hecarim's an interesting one. Yeah, Hecarim there is a good. I guess not going top lane with the Nar in there, that would make sense. And I do like the Annie here as well. Mako has shown some of the strongest Annie play in the LPL. Yeah, probably going to be a, an Annie bottom, especially with the DFG changes. Could still be an Annie mid. It could be an Annie top, but uh, with the Nar, that'll be just a crazy draft if we couldn't couldn't say confidently it's going to be a Nar top. Yeah, I mean, we assume it is, but we'll see here. And of course, EP got a few picks for themselves now as well. Going to look to stick to their guns for the most weeks here. This looks very similar to a 4.21 draft. It is Maokai and Corky there, they're next to. Yeah, a lot of mid-game power coming out of Corky right here. You are letting Def choose his champion. He could go to the Jinx that he's known for, but he's hovering over a hyper carry right here. We'll have to wait what he sticks with, but... His flavor against Cork is usually been battle it with an aggressive hyper carry. Yeah, and I guess nothing really changes for EDG either, just with these picks at least for now. Got a strong initiation support, have the Hecarim for a bit more engaged, and Cora, of course, a good team fighting champion on Nas. So, going to be very similar style for EDG. Very curious to see how they're going to round things out here. They're at least hovering the Lulu right here. They're trying to look for a bit of wave clear. I mean, the initiation wombo potentials between the Nar ultimate or the Hecarim ultimate on, and into the, uh, the wild growth are amazing. And of course, it is a peel tool for. Jinx, they have to blind pick the mid, so I can understand the mid choice here. It's just not the exciting initiation choice we do have been seeing from uh, from Pawn, but he can definitely mix it up and play this champ. Yeah, a bit different here, but EDG do round out the draft with the Jinx like you thought, and it is going to be Lulu likely in the mid lane there as well. So initiation dude is really on clear love this time around on the Hecarim. But what I do like about the Lulu pickup is it's kind of a blocker pickup. There's no champion that can really go in mid lane and really take it to Lulu and boss her out of lane. I mean, there's certainly skill matchups, LeBlanc versus Lulu. LeBlanc has the chance to get ahead of the Lulu, but it's a safe block and it fits the comp because they have so much damage coming out of Deft and a surprising damage coming out of the Hecarim as well. It would make some sense. And wow, they've mixed it up here. They, they've kind of respected the control choice of Lulu and gone full control themselves with the Orianna. Yeah, Orianna, very curious last pick here for EP. Raphael going to take, again, a much safer champion here. Not entirely sure how that matchup in the mid lane is going to go. What are your thoughts there, Papa? I think it's a pretty safe farm matchup. The issue I have is that EP looked like they had kind of a decisive mid-game team with the Corky, and now they've gone late game with the Orion. They've lost that kind of obvious power spike of the mid-game compared to this more late-game centric EDG side. So that to, to be leaning so strong in the mid-game for four picks and then to mix it up and go for a control choice, 
It's just not the cohesive draft I was looking for them there. The, the Blanc at least would have added to more mid-game power. It would have given them a win condition of getting those wards down, starting to pick up that objective snowball and taking out the game in the mid-game to early late game. But uh, committing to the Oriana here, it's a more balanced comp, but it just doesn't have that obvious window of success over this strong EDG lineup. Yeah, we'll have to see how that uh, rattles through there as well. Very strong drafting, I feel like, from both sides. No big surprise, I guess, with maybe the Hecarim being the exception there. It's funny that they've kind of shored up Pawn's lack of initiation here with both Hecarim and Annie, so they make sure they have enough to engage in. This comp looks very similar for EDG in depth. He's really been... Uh, playing Jinx a lot, Neil. He's yeah. been on a tear on Jinx. He loves playing against the Sivir. I can understand the same sort of flavor against the Corky. It's not the most fun time in the early levels, but you can really harass out and win lanes. I mean, we've seen Deft win in a Cogmore versus Corky lane. He can win in a lot of kind of counter matchups just on the strength of his play. It's not usually his laning that, of course, in the past we would have really complimented, but he's been excellent in the LPL so far. Yeah, and EDG in general looks strong, but this looks very similar. So I imagine we'll see kind of some similar, very rotation-heavy style here. But let's find out. We'll get straight into the game. As a child, you would wait and watch for far away. But you always knew that you'd be the one to work while they all play. And welcome back onto the Rift to Edward Gaming versus Energy Pacemaker for our first LPL game of the week here. Edith here on the blue side, EP over on the right, Fat Patch 5.21, brand new patch here as well. And Clearlove is on Hecarim, Papa Smithy. Yeah, he's on Hecarim right here, so I was really interested to see what the level 1 action was from EP. We're already a minute in. We might see a face check coming out, but Clearlove not going too deep. Yeah, Koro popping those boomerangs out as well, just trying to zone Drizzle back towards, but looks like they're just going to get some vision around this jungle here and starting pretty standard jungle starts here as well. Though Amazing J, Koro getting a little too aggressive maybe on the no. You can tell with no aggressive lane wards coming in. Of course, the OMG standard has been those very aggressive lane wards. Probably going to be 2v2s. No, they're still going to opt into a lane swap here. You can see Thresh on this top side of the map right here, so... Even without the extra information, looking like they want the lane swap, do uh, Energy Pacemaker. And that's a, a weird swap for me, to, in, I guess, because Jinx is the champion that you don't really want to leave in any sort of 2v1 situation. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure what they're looking for here. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's to try and uh, keep tabs on this Hecarim and try and really boss him out of the jungle. Of course, you're going to give more uh, space for Thresh to roam into the enemy jungle, get extra vision. So I can understand maybe the theory right there. But you're right, in a simple lane 2v2 matchup, You'd expect Hawkey to opt into almost any 2v2 shot or maybe Caitlyn. And interestingly, Def's actually going to go and pick up the Krugs here for himself, you can see. Uh, does get most of the experience, but not all of it for level 2. And I think we might have had a freeze started in the top lane. Yeah, the freeze does seem to be on. We're just looking at the minimap right here down the bottom lane. Not sure if Def's going to do the same thing right here, so... We're waiting to check this all out, but Mako's actually, and you can see on the minimap here, harassing Drizzle out of his jungle. Yeah, and really smart play there from Mako. Actually just, you know, knowing that Def's going to be fine. He is low on health at level 2 already, so it should be okay. And, and he used a lot of mana there, but does good harassment. And Drizzle's actually forced out at level 2 of his own jungle. And now his timings are completely out of whack. You know, you prepare, you scrim so often to try and get these timings down. But gank paths are going to be significantly changed right here. So Mako, you know, at the cost of half his mana bar, has kind of warped this early game. Yeah, so Pawn here in the mid as well against Raphael. Looking fine right now, a few CS up, but just going to play this pretty casual on the Lulu. And this is a pretty farm-heavy mid lane, it seems like. I mean, the mid lane matchup is definitely going to be farm-heavy. In the top, we kind of have a very interesting matchup. The matchup you might see in solo queue, of course, the Corky top does have quite a lot of power behind it. And now that Thresh is going to help out Amazing J in the bottom lane, the Corky versus Nah matchup in the top. Yeah, so we'll see how that goes. I'm sure Kane is just fine there farming here. And Deft again, sort of slow pushing this wave in towards the bottom. Mako is still here for support as well. Was maybe looking to poke around and get some more pressure on, but they'll have a very bit of a different 2v2 here as Shoes rotated down on the thresh, like you mentioned. So we already mentioned that it is a significant advantage to have Drizzle set behind having to base so early. But another big advantage here is that EDG has solo experience coming on their tank right here. And Maokai has to farm with Thresh. He's going to be behind in experience, potentially behind in farm. 
and we know how big Malka can become. Pokemon from IG has really demonstrated the carry potential if you get that Rod of Ages into the very tanky Maokai. And if you have to go for cost-effective build, the Righteous Glory has almost been the sign of losing Maokais in the LPL so far. Yeah, Drizzle coming into the mid lane. Pong going to take a lot of damage. Ripoff going to slow him down. He'll flash out of the way there on B-save. Really strong pressure though. Pawn forced her back. Yeah, Pawn was actually playing surprisingly up in the lane right there. He obviously recognized that it wasn't the LeBlanc pickup. It was the Orion. Not expecting the burst damage but a significantly good gank, the, the flash is blown. Very strong combo in the top lane as well there by Koro, who goes into the Mega Now form and just chunks Kane down. I mean, Kane in the range west melee matchup does get a bit of hits back and forth, but Koro, as always, playing his now very well in the early stages. You can see EDG has been played very up all these ends. We just mentioned that Palm is a bit surprisingly overextended. Koro was also at Kane's turret at the top. They have a Hecarim jungle. They're not expecting jungle pressure, at least to level six, so... You know, you kind of disrespect the ganking pressure of Drizzle on this Jarvan at your peril. He's been set behind, but Jarvan only needs three levels, maybe even two, to really impact those lanes. Yeah, and I guess Hecarim is a comparison here. Clear love with the Ghost there on his jungle as well. Actually already picked up a quick Trailblazer, so who can a power farm and try and get six as soon as possible? I mean, look, if someone's very overextended, of course you can gank from the back as Hecarim, but in reality, you need that level six, and you scale so well with items and levels. It's kind of why we see Hecarim in solo lanes creeping up. Uh, it's just that he scales so well that, look, he's basically hoping that his lanes can make pressure and buy time for him to be really strong in the mid to late game. Yeah, Edoji's lanes making pressure now. Def gonna farm solo here in the bottom, and Mako is up towards the top now as well. Good pink ward plays down as well. Maybe gonna try and pick off the jungler as they rotate through. Looking for a dive potentially, but are gonna back off here. And yeah, the pink ward's nice right here. Of course, Corky hasn't had the time or the pathing to be able to check it. See, Jarvan and Thresh are actually together in the mini-map right here, so maybe looking for a Rome gank on to top. It's going to be easily spotted away by that pink. Yeah, it seems like EDG might have had some vision there of Jarvan and Thresh being towards the top because they didn't want to commit to the potential dive with the 3v3 incoming, so instead going to clear out some vision. We see this a lot in the LPL with Annie's and even with other supports as well. Lots of early movement and roaming to try and get vision early. Yeah, you often see very under-leveled, malnourished supports walking around. Level 3 is okay here, of course, has access to all her spells, can build up that stun very well. But the result of all this movement is that it's Jinx versus Maokai in the bottom lane. And Maokai getting that free farm actually ahead in CS of Koro, who started in that 1v1 lane. So they've actually rotated very well here, EP. They want to open up as much space as possible for Amazing Day to pick up those items and get an early start. Yeah, and Amazing Day down the bottom, catching up on Farmers all, but even there with Koro's now on the top, who's now 1v2, although Unspin hurts to him, 1v3 now. So getting a bit low on health there as well as Koro might get dived there on the top of it. Seems like he's going to back away and recall quite early on. Yeah, Mako is just a human living ward in the bot lane right here, just allowing Jinx to get as much farm as possible. Level 6 on both the AD carriers already. Credit to Koro, though. He sees no reason to overextend and go for trades. The Thresh was visible. Just happy to back and pick up some items. Yeah, gets a giant spot for himself. Going to make himself pretty tanky in the early stages of this land as we move back in towards the mid as well. Pawn a little behind on CS against Ori, but catching up after the first uh, first gank, sorry. Uh, actually, just double Doran brings so a bit more of an aggressive look here for Lulu. Yeah, it just helps with the wave clear. Of course, Lulu can be very mana intensive. Those were some of the nerfs uh, many patches ago to try and make her laning a bit more sustainable. Uh... So the double Doran's early gives her the faster power spike right here. She loses out and maybe transitioning into the first big AP item, which doesn't have the fiendish codex that Raphael does, but will be very comfortable in the mid. And Hecarim keeps farming, but Drizzle trying to take advantage of this passive jungle and start the, the uh, dragon up. Yeah, I love this as well. Good aggressive pink ward there from EP, and they've warded very well around the dragon. Thresh even going to land some Kanan, who's level 6. Got good DPS on this Gorky early on. And Energy Pacemaker looking to get away with a free dragon here. Energy Pacemaker, one of the hallmarks of their play in the early stages, has been strong dragon control. And the first one's almost snuck away there. But, I mean, just even bigger than dragon control. It was excellent rotations coming out. They swapped up till they could get this 1v1 lane for Maokai. He enters lane with a Catalyst against Na, going to be more sustained in that top lane, do fine in that area, and they pick up the Dragon just from rotation, so I mean credit to EP. M many teams in the LPL have fallen down to EDG's early rotations, but they're doing competitive at least at the 8 minute mark. Yeah, nice little lead, not yet EDG unfortunately farming out very well here in their lane, so able to have actually a pretty reasonable gold lead. Deft, I think, the recipient of a lot of the early farm. And now Pawn in the top, he's going to ulti onto Hecarim. Clearly has gone in as well. Has popped his ulti. Amazing Jay going to go back in. Clearly a little too low. Actually goes down to Maka. Korra going too deep as well. Didn't have the Mega now. A massive miss by EDG. The, the curse of the hype is coming up here, Patient. That was a very questionable dive. It was the straight unstoppable force. Uh, Onslaught of Shadows, sorry, ultimate coming in. Didn't actually fear uh, Maokai away from the turret. They went for the dive anyway with the uh, wild growth right there. 
took tank far too many turret hits and they couldn't even pick up the exit kill. So three people committed and a death coming through is massive for EP. Yeah, it's going to give EP a slight gold lead here as well. Plus they've gotten the first dragon. So things looking good early here for Energy Pacemaker and a bit of a rare mistake that clearly I was hyping up how well he set up ganks all week. That was a rare misfire. They were just trying too hard. You know, they were just putting too much into it. They're willing to go even when the wave wasn't in the right spot for it. And there's no need to overcommit here for EDG. Yeah, so clearly the gank engine it does have a bit of a failure there on the machine. Oh, Cora could be in trouble, actually. Drizzle coming into the top, and Megan are not quite ready yet. Amazing Jake still chasing in there. Drizzle with a good slow. Cora does not have the Narva up yet, and he's going to die in mini Narva form as well. No, Megan does him into the wall. Amazing Jake could be in trouble. Does go low, but Drizzle gets the kill. Cora almost deserved better right there. He was so on point with the vision joking until he had exactly enough rage for the transformation. Doesn't pick up the answer and kill he might have deserved. And again, EP extend that lead. Yeah, about 500 gold now. So pretty slim lead, but a lead nonetheless, which is very impressive against a team like EDG. Can't forget the first dragon that they've gotten as well. So new patch and maybe a new lease on life here. Yeah, for so and, and look, even though we criticize the Oriana pickers maybe not sticking to the comp's wing conditions, they're playing to the wing conditions here. They have the first dragon. They are up in kills in the early game. Maybe it hasn't been a big gold lead right here. But if they continue to play this way and they group with that Trinity Force power spike on Kane, they're still playing a very smart game here of League of Legends. Yeah, and Raphael's had a good lane here as well on the Orianna, leading pawn by quite a number of CS there in the mid lane. I mean, Deft is still receiving a lot of farm here, 86 to 93. Even Kane actually overtaking him there. I mean, EDG sort of picked themselves into a very teamfight-oriented Jinx comp, but that's going to take a while to power up here. But that, and that's the thing. When they pick this comp, they know that they peak mid to late, especially towards the later side of this game. So why are you overly aggressively turret diving with a team that scales so well? It's not like Drizzle was putting out massive jungle pressure and Clearlo was forced into a corner. They basically brute forced an all-in turret dive on a very tanky Maokai. They didn't look at the fact that he already shopped and picked up a Catalyst, and they paid the price. Yeah, Deft actually maybe going in. Maker with the bear ready to go. Does not pop it, though. As it's done swirling around and Deft, I will just continue to clean out CS and at least with an early BF, so Deft is very comfortable in this matchup, even now that they've transitioned back into the 2v2. And any Jinx matchup, the BF so just gives you so much range wave clear. You just saw right there on the screen, three ranged rockets into that back wave will clear it up. It's not Sivir's instant wave clear, but it's very comfortable. Yeah, very comfortable indeed here. As Koro in Mega now form, just going to slap away at some of these minions. Amazing, Jay. Almost actually with Rod of Ages, actually, so looking for a strong timing there in Koro who uh, didn't quite get the trade kill he was looking for in the last one. Going to continue to play his Nah. There's clearly have actually has come down to the bottom, but Energy Pacemaker maybe sniffing out the gank have already recalled back to their base. Yeah, that's smart backing and timing right there. There's no dragon available, so there's no risk of losing the objective from the back. Again, EP playing very smartly. This is probably the strongest 12 minutes we've seen for them so far this season. I mean, maybe not the most exciting there. Level 3, Scion, Elise, and Dragon excluded, but very smart. You're right here, playing almost like we'd expect EDG to when we saw them play last week. And next Dragon's back in a minute 50 here. Uh, Energy Pacemaker, especially if that Corky Trinity Force comes online, have a very good shot of just shutting out EDG of the next Dragon. And I guess the acid test, again, you, you do reference that game where they picked, they did the innovative strategy. They picked up the first Dragon, and then they did nothing with it. So I guess the question is, can they capitalize secure vision on the second? We do see Drizzle and Shu. Together, this could be Dandy Mata if we did some name changes right here. Get preparing for the dragon early. It's 1 minute 30 till the dragon spawns. They are playing towards their win conditions. And this is the next level of development for this EP side. They're at least playing like they know how to win and close out games of League of Legends. Yeah, so looking good so far. But we'll have to see Dragon back up in a minute 10 now. And EDG are going to look to contest if they can. A pickaxe done for Jinx. There's also a slight increase in power coming through. And it's like Koro going for a hex drinker there after his giant spell with a longsword and a non magic mantle already in his inventory. Yeah, he is in the bottom lane. Actually seeing Kane taking a lot of damage. He could be in trouble. They're actually Rocket's going to come in. Death going to try and line up the slow. Does get it. Looking for the flash. Does go in. But a good land is the kill. And Death actually orders a minion. Does get the kill. But he's going to die here under the turret with the box there as well. And a good trade kill there for EP. I'm not sure what's in the water here this week for EDG. They're just going very crazy and thirsty for those kills right here. They came into this match confident, but they're really overextending with almost no reason. They lose the mid turret and mid as well. Yeah, Death also hit the slow and had his ultimate there. Very odd choice to not try and snipe Corky with the ulti. Instead, flashing under the turret and missing the next auto. So, yeah, you're right. EDG not playing like the, the team we hyped them up to be. And Energy Pacer got playing very well. I mean, you analyze that point and you say, all right, you can flash the Jinx ult. It is predictable. It does have a cast time. But if you step back and you're like, wait, if I fire that ult and the enemy AD carry flashes and has to exit lane, I still open up such a massive CS and wave control advantage that it's still a big win. But they're so greedy for these kills, they're so greedy for the gold, 
that they're really paying for it here. Yeah, very bloodthirsty here. And Energy Pace Tank are going to saunter in for this next dragon here. No vision again from EDG around the area. And the first one, sure, I'll call it a steal. This one is robbery. And this is this is a hole they dug themselves with the over-aggressive turret dive right here. There was never time to go and put down wards because Deft was dead. And it's very uh, scary here for Annie and, and her low level to go and put down any wards. So, I mean, look, EDG are making their bed right here. They are here in... I mean, Kane does have his Trinity Force now in the bottom lane. Dev gonna do what he can here. Cleans out webs very quickly with the Berserker Greaves and the two components of the IE, but that's nothing compared to the power spike of Corky. Yeah, the completed Trinity Force is such a big power spike over Dev's uh, Infinity Edge components right here. The Berserker Greaves helps with the wave here, like you say, but now they can't even stand toe to toe with the lane they were bullying around not two minutes ago. Yeah, Dev falling behind in CSC. Kane 130 or so to 115. We've got 137 to 7, uh, to seven so a 30 CS difference there in the mid as well. Blue we're going to take his own already, but EDG kind of any defense. In fact, Drizzle might just walk in for the steal. Didn't get it, I think, yeah, did manage to secure it there on Hecarim, but that's a small win there for Edward Gaming. You can see from Pawn's position the fact that he's helping out with this buff. The EDG, I mean, and Pawn in particular, is playing from behind. He recognizes the lack of gank pressure that Clear Love has on this Hecker room. And it's just been allowing himself to lose in CS. 34 CS is a massive disadvantage. Yeah, Bear though coming in on to shoot. Clear Love going in there as well. Knocks him back with the E. And now Dev can fire in. Clear Love does have his ult. He does he want to go in. Kane and Drizzle could be in trouble. A good rampage there for Clear Love. The ult he comes in. Gets them both there with it. The double kill for Clear Love. And he almost got the triple. Yeah, he finally gets the snowball going. So important on this Hecarim. The extra gold is very useful on Clear Love. Usually you say, okay, leave it for the AD carry. But if Clear Love gets tanky and can be a huge frontliner, they'll be massive for this EDG team comp despite the early game hiccups. Yeah, and sort of atones himself for the earlier dive in the top lane. That was a very well executed lane gank by Clear Love. And you can see the power of the Annie Hecker and Wombo combo. That's such hard initiation. And we don't usually see a lot of success for lane ganks because usually you have to overplay your hand. You know, someone will play suspiciously overextended or suspiciously defensive. In that case, it was just perfect coming out of Clear Love. Yeah, very well timed there as well. Syncing up with Mako to support Annie to make sure that all good done. And the top line, Amazing J, he's going to get slapped around. He does get the solo kill under the turret in Megana from Koro flexes his muscles. So they repeated the aggressive overdive right there, I could see on my screen. But this time, Koro was just so damn tanky. Had the Hex Drinker shield, had the Giant Spell, able to tank up four, five, six turret hits. They get the kill, and that's what they're looking for. But the, the minion wave in mid is going to keep pushing in now that they have this turret down. Yeah, and Pawn, of course, betraying the solo kill actually was there to help his friend Koro in the top lane. So not quite the 1v1 dive, but a very strong uh, dive there with Koro and a great roam from Pawn. So Energy getting some kills on the board. Now flip the gold lead back to about 1,500 in their advantage. But Energy Pacemaker still with the first two dragons. Very strong start still for them. And an item build I want to talk about is the completed Warmog's armor coming out of Koro. You might wonder, okay, it only gives you health doesn't give you any of those resists. It's not the randoms. It does delay any potential randoms, which is so, so strong on the Nara here. But what I do like about it is that Corky does so much mixed damage that health is probably the smartest stat to itemize really early right here for Koro. If his goal is to get in the middle of fights, Ride that wild growth and initiate. He's very tanky. Me and EDG rotating their jinx around now. Got the tower in the bottom and immediately go top to take the next tower. And might even pressure this one. But down the bottom, energy pacemaker also pressuring a tier 2 turret. So we might have a very open map here quickly. Although Pawn is coming down to assist with the wave clear. Yeah, EP haven't fully committed to the grouping, but they do have this Trinity Force pocket. They know they have an advantage in wave clear. But with Lulu there, the wave clear from EDG is very respectable. Coro looking to go in potentially as well. Doesn't want to get Oriana ulted. About half health now, but the Warmogs here. Keeping him very healthy early on and going to throw some boulders up there. Megana Farm, good poke actually out onto Shu, but has to be careful. Does find a ward. Kane actually maybe going to face check in. The wallop does land a car. Is he going to knock him into the wall? He goes in for a clear up. Can't quite follow up yet. He's now riding in on the horse, using the E to go through. Should be able to catch him, but a good lantern now and a flay for good measure by Shu. The teleport's actually coming in here, face time. Could be bad news. Scrap does go into Koro. There's back in the mini now. Farm, going to take a good amount of damage. The wild growth may be enough to save him, but Raphael going to get that kill instead. Yeah, they were able. I mean, Coral was so aggressive trying to bait the engage. Clear Love had his ultimate up the whole time, but knew they didn't have the damage to get a kill in the front line right there. Jinx, of course, was splitting the whole time. They will push in mid right here, so if they do swap a turret for a kill, it will be an adva advantageous for EDG, but they have to back away. Yeah, nice use of the Trailblazer smite. They're just to blast down those minions and sort of deny any of the push here coming through. Def will find a pink wood there with Mako, although, and he's going to yep, clear it out there with the help of his AD carry. And good pressure by EDG. They tried to buy a lot of time, but only the two out of turret. It's not the three. You can see the snowball has already come on significantly here for Hecarim. Although he only has the regular boots, it's the warrior enchantment and a completed Sunfire Cape 
compared to no boots and the sight stone is the auxiliary item there for Jarvan. So in terms of combat stats here, a huge advantage for Hecarim. I do like the Sightstone Jarvan just because he's not going to be looking to duel. He's going to be looking to put down the wards to stop those aggressive lane ganks that have proved successful for Clearlove, but definitely significantly behind in gold. And it's very weird to see Clearlove not even just farming as much. That's not that old, but to be on more of a carry style or just a big initiator here from the jungle, not playing the usual control style that we've seen so often in the last few weeks. Yeah, in the first four weeks, you'd say, all right, Clearlove's going to build a jungle item, might be the tanky one, might be the warrior then build Sightstone. I mean, he was actually the first person to popularize the Sightstone Java that's picked up play across the world, but he's going for the more uh, more selfish flavor. After the, the buffs to Hecarim's uh, jungle clear, he falls a little bit less uh, in terms of health in the jungle in the first clear. He's slightly less vulnerable to counter jungling in that way, just because he tops off his health a bit better, but he's still the late game beast he's always been right here. So EDG, They've built comps around death, they've built comps around pawn, now Clearlove's getting a knock. Yeah, and you can see Clearlove with his items looking strong. Corey already mentioned him. Pawn a little behind, actually, just the Athenes and a blasting one here with the double drones. But death looking strong now, Avarice Blade and the Infinity Edge is done. And Mako's actually picking up the slack for the vision as well. Got his Moby Boots uh, enchanted already with the Distortion Plus, the Sidestone. This is going to be a very interesting contest here on the Dragon, especially now that a Rabadon's just got completed by Orianna. And this time, EG haven't done an overly aggressive I dive right here so that everyone's healthy. Do have good wards around the dragon. EP need to continue this dragon snowball, but EDG are definitely ready. Yeah, they've got a, a chance to contest here, but Energy Pacemaker looked very scary in this mid game. Maokai maybe still powering up, but decently tanky on the early game with the Giants both. Two items done for both Corky and Orianna here. Energy Pacemaker with a strong cup, so EDG have to contest very carefully. You have to be careful with tank who's tanking. It has to be amazing, Jay, because Drizzle will take too much damage. We know they're being corralled away. Yeah, Coral actually gets a lot of rage. Yeah, clearly, gonna dive in there with the ulti. Mako dives in as well, and Death trying to do the damage, but Kane's gonna answer back and drizzle great peel back there good wild quite throw on the pawn and Kara is fighting so many people in towards the back Clearlo gonna get low amazing Jay will finally get traded down Kane now gonna look to get blown up by Death Jinx and the resets are coming through thick and fast Raphael goes down Shu's gonna look to fall here as well and there's the ace for Edward Gaming massive fight there for Jinx who was free hitting at the back of the fight the whole time EDG's team fighting is always a treat and the positioning from Death you might criticize his laning. It's been very strong in the LPL so far, but still unparalleled in a team fight. And good news, everyone. Korosna still very good, as it seems in the last fight. Completely zoning off the back line there as well. EDG going to take their first dragon of the game as well. They've started putting themselves back on the front foot. Yeah, it was very important for them to pick up a dragon right there. It gets them back, gets them some breathing. Of course, the 6% the stats are only going to become more important as the game goes on. So EP, they really need to redouble on their vision control because they're in danger of letting go of a very smart 20 minutes of League of Legends. We're going to see the replay right here. It's a tale of two front lines. Clear Love can go so aggressively with the item Snowboy, as in Koro as well, are so tanky. The, the initiation uh, shockwave right there is wonderful. It gets many people on low health, but death is free hitting at the back line. It takes so long. I mean, Orianna, all the carries have to run away from the Nara here. It's so tanky in the back line. He gets the solo kill on Raphael. Death finishes it off in the back line. It's so easy to play a hyper carry when your front line is just so damn tanky. Yeah, and even Lulu getting in there, she turns any tank into a super tank. But Porn actually tanked most of that damage himself in that particular fight. Now it's a Rabadon for himself as well. After falling behind in lane, that's a big influx of gold for the Lulu. Yeah, he's actually equalized the items between himself and the Orianna, so it was a massive fight for Porn as well. Yeah, and Porn again kind of did what he could in that team fight with the Lulu, basically front line for Deft. And we've seen what happens when EDG can protect their hyper character and Deft. Lulu Looking to carry this game on the Jinx as well. Static Shiv also done in there as on well. EDG. That gold lead's grown quite significantly the last few minutes. 4,000 gold ahead now. And when we see these big, big Maokais, we usually think about their initiation potential. The fact that they can go in, soak so much damage, and have the regular CC. But when they're completely trying to peel away a Diver, they don't do a lot to the Naran Hecarim right here. They have one round of CC. They have to wait out their cooldowns. But their carries are really suffering with Nara and, and uh, this Hecarim in their face. Really overtuned jungler, especially so, so strong compared to this Jarvan. And they can't get thrust that front line to even hope to get on top of death. The first reset comes out, you know this Jinx is going to run crazy. Yeah, Korra actually going in amazing. He's diving onto Death Jinx, trying to go back in. A good trump, but they're clear. Going to peel back there as well. And now Kane going to dive in, but Death going to try and chuck him out. A good wild growth there, going to save the AD. His Omega goes down, but it's just rip, being ripped apart here. A poor EP. That's three kills in a row. Drizzle low might be the fourth. Mako goes down, and EDG trade 3-1. EDG team fighting like a top team right there. The flash from Death was necessary, but the play around him, specifically Clear Love's mechanics, to fear all the frontline initiation away from death. Open up space for that AD carry. The free hit right there. 
the Barons the result. Yeah, we saw Khalilov, you know, really sticking up for his buddy, Def there. They've gotten along in China. We were worried in the last few weeks that he didn't have the same love here, but Khalilov, Vantaz is coming up there, gets hooked there as well. Play back into the wall, but Drizzle gets melted, and the Khalilov, Def Love, still very much there. Yeah, Drizzle won an exit kill right there. There was no, it was always going to be a one-for-one one at best, and you never want to trade in those situations, and Khalilov... He shrugs it off. He's so tanky, it doesn't even matter. Yeah, Hecarim looking strong here and Deft, an absolute beast here on this Jinx. 3, 1, and 9 here with a Baron buff now as well. Actually, maybe looking to steal away the blue buff. Now he's always good. He's always pushing his leads right here. Corky's so far away, he should pick it up, but let's just come back to EDG for a second. Let's say, all right, it was a bit of a shaky early game. They did give away the first two dragons. But have you noticed that Clearlov always gets done what he wants, what he sets out to do? He didn't build a sidestone here, so they never had the overwarding in to take easy dragons. Instead, he redoubled on farming, he got the ganks off he wants, and now he's set up to carry the mid game in these team fights with a really tanky frontliner. So, EDG, they understand their win conditions. They gave away the dragons. Okay, they were over aggressive in dives, but they're definitely at a point right here where EP. They need to get some wards and picks or they're going to lose this game. Yeah, so pickaxe done there for Deft as well. So powering up as well. Clearly also getting even tanky there with another giant spell added into his inventory. Love the Talisman of Ascension here as well. And a Thornmail for Koro. And the Talisman of Ascension, of course, giving bonus damage to Hecarim with that passive. He does scale off the move speed right there. I mean, Koro, Warmogs into Thornmail. I mean, Randwins is a wonderful item. It gives you team fight control. But when you have Hecarim diving in, just the sheer stack of health and the sheer armor right here. What is a Corky to do against this front line? Literally, they will soak all the damage this mid-game Corky has, shrug it off, and, you know, you could add in a completed the Blade of the Rune, and then you can even have a Last Whisper, and he's just going to be tickling this front line. Yeah, and an aptly named Hecarim passive there, Warpath, which is exactly what Khalilov is looking to cleave between Energy Pacemaker. Koro still farming here in the top. Actually has a build toward a Cutlass now, so a bit more aggression in that build coming through. Koro feels like he's tanky enough at this point. EP on the other side. Do have a random jump for the Maokai, and Amazing Days of Rod is likely fully charged there with the Roa. Uh, build toward a Cutlass through there for Korki, so looking for his own Blade of Yeah, we see the turrets falling in bot lane right here, the tanks trading in top. EDG's groups are so strong. They can shrug off this two damage composition. We didn't even mention the fact so much is relying on Orianna and Corky right here. The Warmog's health stat, that'll negate any burst from Orianna. And Corky just can't get any damage on the squishier members right here. The front line's too strong, so they can shrug that damage. And Jinx, she doesn't have the last whisper yet, but she's already massively power tuned. Yeah, looking very strong here, EDG. That lead has grown really quickly, actually. It was about 4,000 gold five minutes ago. It's getting closer to 10,000 gold at this point as well. They're about 600 gold away from that goal here. Pawn strong there with these two items. Villain. EDG, they know not to mess around. They're going to try and push in and get an even bigger lead. And they've already shown the turret dive, and they're not going to stop here, especially since they know they're ahead in this game. I'm just waiting for them to pull the trigger. It could be under a turret. It could be a measured game. EDG have all the options in the world. Yeah, Cora just getting aggressive, pushes down another tier 2 turret. So only one left now for EP, and they're defending it as four in the mid here. Teleports up for both top laners, and they're even looking to rotate down as well, but Koro... Uh, intelligently applying pressure here in EDG. No to be patient. Can they get the successful split push objective and taking that top turret right here. They can group and dive or they can group and zone. You can see Koro right here. He's completely known to the enemy team, but he's happy with that. Yeah, and they take up the other turret. And will, clear love is massive right now. He actually popped an elixir of iron, maybe looking to go in there. So he is incredibly tanky at this point. Yeah, the extra tenacity right there does stack with those Mercury Treads. They're multiplicatively, so not going to be the massive tenacity right there. But once he gets in the front, as long as he's soaking damage from Cool. He's kind of done his job. Yeah, and EDG going to move in for their second dragon now. So Energy Pacemaker, who started off so well controlling those objectives, haven't been able to contest ever since those six turrets got knocked down. And that's the biggest difference here. It's not just the strong team burning from EDG, but what they've done once they started winning those fights. Absolutely. They, when, they, when they pick up a kill, you know they're going to pick up objectives. They've got all the outer turrets down already on the map. No Azir in this map, so there's definitely six outer turrets. They're just looking super, super strong, and they're playing to their win conditions. I, I harp on it a lot, but... If you go back and realize why they didn't pick up those dragons, okay, some of it was mistakes. They were too overly decisive in those top lane ganks when they didn't need to be, but they didn't try to control an objective they didn't set up for. They didn't have the wards, so they were, okay, we'll give up this objective. But in terms of tuning right here, having such a strong front line, I mean, the Blade of the Ruin King's completed on Chorus is even going to be a relevant damage threat. They isolated what was strong about this EP comp, mid-game rotations. And with an overtuned jungler in the front, those rotations are kind of for naught. Yeah, and I actually like Koro's little pick up there as well. Maybe trying to supplement the slightly weaker uh, damage Lulu. Although Point is going for a Lich Bane as his next item here. So he's actually been doing very significant damage here in towards the later stages of the mid game. And EDG going to split up again here. 3-1-1 now. I mean, worth knowing that, of course, Lich Bane 
Uh, makes a lot of sense on Lulu because she's an auto attack based champion. She already has augments on her auto attack with her passive right there, and she's going to get in range for spells, you know, whether they're used defensively and offensively. So it's a very smart pickup. A bit later than we're used to uh, in previous patches because the numbers were tuned down on that item, but it'll fit the build right here, right now, and they don't need anything else. You know, they're, they're definitely tuned in terms of items. EDG not needing too much else now, just being patient here. Cora does transform into Mega Nova. Baron back in a minute 40. EDG having a bit of trouble maybe cracking those base turrets here, but they can wait for the next Baron and Siege. That way, that's where they want to go. Yeah, look, they can wait for the Baron aggressively dive. They could go for a full-on dive right here, and there's such a health stack, especially with the wild growth, that I'm sure it'll be fine as well. But EDG, they don't want to make any more mistakes. They've been uncharacteristic in the first 10 minutes. I think they're going to try and finish this game out solidly. Yeah, and the gold lead's massive now. 12,000 gold and counting for EDG, who just keep getting mountains of gold. EP, to their credit, are going to get lots of farm here in the minutes that EDG aren't pressuring them, so as all the lanes are pushing through. But the leads here are just massive across the board. 11,000 gold on everyone but that support. Yeah, but we, we do need to take solace. I mean, EP especially will take solace in the fact that the two previous series we've seen from EDG, or at least two of them were the series against M3 and a series against World Elite, where those teams were completely blown away in the early game by EDG's rotation. EP were not. EP had a very strong first 10 minutes right here. They haven't played poorly in the mid game. They've just been kind of caught off guard by just how strong this Hecarim Nar initiation comp is. And Lulu 307 doing so respectively as Pawn after being 40 CS down in the mid lane at one point. I mean, I have to say, EP get even maybe a bit more credit there as well. It's not just that they didn't fall to the early rotations. They out-rotated EDG for the first 10 to 12 minutes here. So a very strong early game. But this late game looks very tricky. Yeah, definitely worth clarifying. And Koro, he's tanky, but uh, there's a lot of members in top yeah, lane. It seems like Pawn is rushing up there to try and help him. Orianna going to cut him off. Koro, back in the mini now, Pawn took a lot of damage, but had to blow his flash there in order to get out safely. So EP gets some aggression, but those side are still pushing in. Yeah, the bot lane especially is pushing in very aggressively by this minute. It's been well set up by EDG right here. Top lane is going to continue to push, and they're trying to rotate mid. Oh, Pawn so annoying as on now. Split push duty on this Lulu as well. Whimsy himself away. Does it again there with the blue buff, and all of that CDR going so low here. And EDG, very smart take at this Baron. Would have been a difficult contest for Energy Pacemaker, even though. It does know they are the first to rotate, so Lulu will not make it here, so they can force a fight. It will be a fight Jay before. And he steals the Baron. Drizzle manages to pick it up. The Shockwave goes to clear up. Forced to ult the out, but that's a great AoE there. Death just rips through members of EP. Kane goes down as well. That's fine. Five quick kills, a triple for Deft as well. Deft in the back doing so much damage after the Tibbers came down right there. I do like the idea from EP, but just because they knew that Lulu was significantly split away from her carries. They tried to make the contest. They knew the game would end if they gave up the Baron. But the ace comes through for EDG. Absolutely insane Wombo. Again, we saw the Annie plus Hecarim combo. Death with those rockets just destroyed Energy Pacemaker. Yeah, and look, the, the, the death time is at this point. It's only 10 seconds, but Death is completely ripping through turrets right here. I think the surrender vote comes through. I see the GGs in chat. That's going to be the game. Yeah, it looks like it is going to be. an EDG will claim the end of that game in style there. Was a little shaky, maybe a bit quieter than we used to hear from them, but Death and the Jinx ended that very stylishly. And I loved the, the Hecarim kill pick up from Clear Love. I didn't know how it was going to go. He's in the buffs, but he's still a champion that needs some setup, needs to be babied through those early levels. The first turret dive didn't fill me with confidence, I'm going to be honest. But after that double kill on the bot lane, was able to get up, able to get strong, and really ripped through the front lines right there. Yeah, we have a replay there as well, so let's catch a bit more of the action from EDG. So this is going to be right at the end here, at the Baron fight, so we'll roll the tape right here. If you look at the minimap, Lulu is significantly split away from her teammates, and EP are very smart to understand this is what's happening. She tries to draw away the team, they go for the initiation right here. The steal comes through, it's massive of course for EP, but in the background you can see Death at the corner of your screen there, he's pre-hitting. And the burst damage from those ranged rockets are incredible, switches to minigun to pick up the Corky as well. The front line is just too strong. Koro still has basically full health right there to tell you just how strong he is. And EDG, they team fought very well. They gave away advantages in the early game. It was good to see EP take them. It was definitely a step up from the uh, level one Scion Dragon into not much really. But uh, they got the second one and just kind of fell away after Hecarim really got rolling. Yeah, so a strong shot from EP, but EDG still looking like one of the best teams in the world, if not at least the best team in China. So we're going to see them again. Don't go anywhere. We're going to have a quick break here, but game two between EDG and EP is coming right up.